Hello, I'm Dr. Paul Morrissey, President of Campion College. And today I'm really honoured to be speaking at this, you know, a special podcast, a Campion podcast uh, via Zoom with Mr. Greg Sheridan. And we're going to be speaking about his, his most recent book, Christians, The Urgent Case for Jesus in Our World. Now, Greg is foreign editor of The Australian, but he's also an honorary fellow of Campion College. And it's a, it's a great honour to have Greg with us to speak about this fantastic new book. Welcome, Greg. Thanks so much, Paul. It's fantastic to be with you. And I must say being honorary fellow at Campion is the absolute zenith and highlight of my career so far. <laughs> I'm very pleased to hear that, Greg. And, uh, and it's, it's great to have you associated with the college and, uh, and, and to speak a bit more about this, this great new book. Now, the first thing I wanted to ask you, Greg, is, you know, you're foreign editor of The Australian, so you're usually dealing in the, in the, in the hard reality of real politic and, uh, and foreign affairs and, and politics. And here you are writing sort of two books, a, a bit of a, um, you know, in, in a sense they belong together, on the place of religion in the world and not particularly Christianity in the world. So I guess what, what was the motivation behind, behind doing this? So, Paul, uh, it's kind of you to ask that, and a lot of people have. And I don't entirely have a good answer, uh, but a couple of things. First of all, so I've been a professional, full-time professional journalist for 43 years, and, um, and I've watched the culture become progressively anti-Christian. And uh, I think that um, I finally discovered two truths, really, that Politics is downstream of culture and culture is downstream of faith, um, which is a, a phrase our common friend um, Carl Schmuder used recently. And I, so I think to get to the heart of the heart of even the cultural and political crisis, actually, you need to go back to the crisis of belief. But also um, two other subsidiary motive or two other motivations, they're not subsidiary. One is that, um, you know, you realise your, your, your moment um, your meeting with the maker is coming coming ever ever sooner. And, and as a 40 years more plus journalist, you think, my goodness me, there's a lot to make up for. You know, there, there ought to be some little positive thing on the, on the ledger. And then finally, you know, journalism is a search for the truth and a search for good material. And you finally realise that Christianity is true. I've always believed that. But it's also a great story. And... Uh, uh, so there's a, an element. I'm, I'm, I write these books very much as a journalist, and I'm pushed by journalistic instincts to to the great story. In fact, I think that's one of the great things about these two books is 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 your journalistic instinct, and that really comes out. And often, you know, I've obviously read a lot of books about Christianity and God, which are more theological books and fantastic in and of themselves. But as a journalist, you bring something slightly different to that, you know, the pursuit of God and, and how, you know, God is being um, believed in and followed today, um, you know, the way you interview people. So I think it's a, it's a real credit to you. And also, you know, the fact that you are a journalist brings something fresh and new to this whole topic. Well, thanks, Paul. I'm so glad you felt that. I mean, people have written books who are lawyers about the evidence for the resurrection and that sort of thing. And People have written books who are scientists and bring a scientific uh, sensibility to it. I read the, the New Testament um, very much as a journalist, looking for the story, the meaning, the sources, not, not sort of great biblical scholarship inquiry into, you know, speculating on who the sources are, but Luke is full of scoops about the birth of Jesus and so on, obvious to a journalist that his source is Mary. And Luke is the kind of... Uh, the Bob Woodward of, uh, of the early Jesus movement. Um, Mark has all these episodes that are so disobliging to Peter, you know, uh, denying Jesus three times, falling asleep in Gethsemane. You can just see Peter saying to him, I want you to include this because I want people to see that we apostles were pretty, pretty bloody hopeless until Christ lifted us up. And, uh, and of course, the stories themselves are so riveting. There's such brilliant, dynamic humanity. You know, I love Paul in Galatians saying, I wish all these people who are misleading you would go and castrate themselves. And uh, Peter in his in one of his letters saying, oh, look, I get it. Paul is a bit difficult, you know, he's a bit hard to understand, a bit hard to follow, but you just got to put up with him. He's my beloved brother. His writings are the scriptures. And uh, there's 
to, I was surprised at how much kind of raw humanity there is in uh, in the New Testament, apart from the central story of Jesus himself, of course. Yeah, and obviously this new book is is more focused on the on the Gospels and the figure of Christ himself, whereas the the previous book, God is Good for You, was was more a, a look at monotheism and 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 God Himself, and and you delved a bit more into the Old Testament. So they really do, you know, uh, go well together. And I just wanted to read the first paragraph of the preface of your book. You know, why this book called Christians? Because I think it sort of gets at the heart of this little project. This book is about the compelling, dramatic, gripping characters you meet in the New Testament. Above all, it is the search for Jesus. It seeks to meet him directly in the New Testament and in history and to meet him indirectly through his friends, both his first friends and some of his friends today. And and really, I mean, obviously the first paragraph in the preface should encapsulate a book, but that does it really, really well. And and that's what you've set out to do. And I I wonder, you know, when coming to the New Testament as a journalist, um, which I think is, is a really interesting way to approach it, how... Um, you know, what, what was what perhaps is your favourite, you know, to put it, I guess a little bit crudely, what's your favourite gospel in the, in, the, in the New Testament? So, Paul, I think theologically we're not supposed to have favourites, but, of course, that doesn't matter. We, we all do, and uh, journalists certainly do. So my favourite gospel, and some people ask me where to start with the Bible because people are a bit intimidated by the Bible, even by the New Testament, and they shouldn't be, of course, because it's a terrific read. It's a fantastic read, as long as you've got a decent translation. Um, My favourite gospel is Luke. Uh, There are a lot of things to like about Luke. Luke has the most women in in his gospel, and therefore it's, in a sense, the warmest. Um, Luke has the great uh, stories of Mary at the start of his gospel, and uh, Mary emerges as a fantastic uh, figure of great agency. I, I think we underestimate Mary's agency and her... Her, um, her intentional influence on history. You know, it wasn't a passive, wasn't a passive influence. Uh, the other thing I like about Luke is that he, he really is the Bob Woodward of the early Jesus movement. Luke is a journalist, really. I mean, I know he was a physician, but he, he says at the start of his book, look, here I am. He doesn't use the word journalist, but he says, I, I've, I've interviewed everybody. I've read all the other accounts. I've got the great scoops for you. So here it is. Here's my here's my great story, and of course it's wonderfully uh, accessible. And because it starts with such a um, a strong narrative of um, of the of the conception and birth of Jesus, it gives you a lovely human context. I think so. All the Gospels are great. They all have uh, wonderful things. You know, Mark is a savage recounting of the of the Passion, which is very powerful. Indeed. But but to answer your question, my, my favourite gospel is Luke, I think. Right. Excellent. Um, one thing that I really also appreciated, particularly in that, that first part of the book, so like the previous book, it's sort of divided up into, I guess, a bit more of um, the, the theology, if you like, in the first half and then the, you know, the practical living out, you know, through your interviews and, and looking at contemporary Christians in the in the second part and and different aspects of Christianity in the second part. So it follows a similar pattern, which is which works really well, I think. Uh, but in that first part, one, one thing I, I did appreciate is that you do, again, as a journalist, look at, you know, some of the debates about, you know, the historicity around the Gospels. And, and that's been played out, particularly in the last couple of centuries, um, amongst Protestants and now amongst Catholics, with biblical scholarship. You know, in some ways, you know, I would say, trying to divorce what they term the Christ of faith from the Jesus of history. So you've got your, your creeds, but it doesn't really correlate, they say, with, you know, what we see in the Gospels and the, and the, and the Jesus of, of history. Um, I wonder if you could maybe comment a bit about that. Um, I know you, you reference um, the terrific book by Richard Borkman, um, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. I, I love that book. Um, but yeah, if you if you wouldn't mind commenting on this, I guess dichotomy and um, between you know as these scholars point out between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. So Paul, um, to put it in context, in a way, uh, it, it seems to me the great project of disenchantment uh, of Western civilization over the last two or three hundred years, the great modernist project, has rested on two propositions. One is 
that God is dead, that science has declared God is dead. And in a sense, my first book, God is Good for You, was an answer to that proposition. Uh, God is is not dead, and um, and the arguments for that proposition are so absurd and antique and woolly and musty. And the new atheists just sit them beside a lot of irrelevant science, which which has nothing to do with their arguments. And then the second proposition of the Great Disenchantment Project is that the New Testament is either all lies or mythology or folklore, and you can't take it seriously. Now, um, a couple of things about it. The first is biblical scholarship ought to recognise its own limits. So I don't dismiss or devalue biblical scholarship, but a lot of it is a kind of inferential literary criticism. And having been 40 years in mainstream journalism, let me tell you, the most brilliant journalists cannot work out the, the source of a leak or the author of an anonymous document, you know, uh, in my own life, I've written lots of different styles. Of, you know, I've written press releases for companies and books and essays and short newspaper articles. No one could work out from the style anything significant about the author. Um, similarly, uh, one of our prime ministers, Alfred Deacon, used to write newspaper columns about himself for a London paper while he was prime minister. The idea that you could... So I, I think biblical scholarship ought to have a certain modesty. But as it happens... A tremendous uh, weight of biblical scholarship has gone back to the view that the Gospels are historical, good historical sources. So I don't propose that history can prove the resurrection and the miracles and the divinity of Jesus. But I do think history now does prove that Jesus lived at the time the Gospels say that he was crucified under the rule of Pontius Pilate, that he died and that a very short time later, the Jesus movement was proclaiming his resurrection and his divinity. So I think uh, an honest historian can accept all that and still reject Christ's divinity. And as you say, I, I quote some of the scholars who've gone back to that, uh, to that view. And um, one who I think is fantastic and who certainly influenced my thinking a lot is Richard Balkum with this wonderful book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. And he makes a lot of very straightforward points. It's not a book inaccessible unless you're an academic. Uh, for example, he says, even the conventional datings of the gospel, of the gospels, Mark in the 60s, uh, uh, Matthew and Luke in the 70s and 80s, and John in the 90s, even if that's, that dating is true, then the, all of the gospels were written within one lifetime of Jesus' death. So they couldn't possibly have been a result of a long multi-generational oral tradition which introduced lots of inaccuracies. And then we know the writings of Paul began in the 50s and he was writing to Christian groups who already believed completely in the doctrine of the resurrection. So that tells you uh, the early Christians right from the get-go believed in the resurrection. By 64 AD, Nero is blaming the fires in Rome on Christians. So they've spread from Palestine to Rome and they're a big enough nuisance for Nero to scapegoat them. Then going along simultaneously with that is a whole long process of archaeological discovery which keeps bearing out the New Testament. So um, the Dead Sea Scrolls reveal a couple of important things for scholarship, but one thing they reveal is that the Jewish, the rural Jewish life that the Gospels describe is extremely accurate. And it would have been impossible for people making this up 100 years later in a Christian uh, centre in Rome or Ephesus or somewhere to imagine that Jewish life in all its rich detail. Then it used to be said that um, crucifixion victims didn't get uh, separate burials, so that's ob obvious anachronism. And then they discover a Jewish burial site with the bones preserved of a Jewish man who was crucified, nail marks in his feet and so forth, and did get a proper burial. So the gospel uh, is accurate. History prior to that archaeological discovery was inaccurate. And the final example, and you'd know all these, and there are, there are dozens and dozens of them. The final example is uh, the gospels call Pontius Pilate prefect. Uh, for a time, historians thought that was an anachronism because a Roman historian gave Pontius Pilate a different title, and then they discovered an inscription, a stone inscription from the time, which used the title prefect. So 
I don't believe in Christianity because of these archaeological dis discoveries, nor do I believe in Christianity because scholars have swung back to the historicity of the New Testament. But modern readers, modern people should know not the Da Vinci Code interpretation of Jesus, but they should know that, that uh, the weight of scholarship now bears out the historicity of the New Testament in everything that can be tested. Yeah, I completely agree, uh, Greg, and that's what I, yeah, I found that really valuable, that that particular chapter. And it's a chapter that I think Christians need to read because, you know, we are bombarded often, you know, every Easter there's some new documentary or some article saying, oh, no, we found, you know, Jesus' tomb and his bones definitely or, you know, <laughs> some, some crackpot theory about yeah. Jesus. But, you know, they, you know, Christians need to understand that, you know, it's not why we believe, but it's not incongruent with belief. And uh, and I think that's uh, absolutely spot on. The other thing I think, and you've just mentioned it a little bit there, um, one of the great problems I find in the church today and for Christians in particular is that in some ways they've, we've lost a sense of the enchantment of, of, of these this original narrative of who Jesus is and really the strangeness of the Gospels, the strangeness, this you know, incredible strangeness of the Gospels. And, um, you know, when you read them as, as, as texts, and uh, particularly as a believer, um, and come with it with fresh eyes, you're just struck by how extraordinary, you know, that not only the miracles, but just, you know, the words of Christ himself, which are, you know, groundbreaking and, and should sort of shake us, uh, I guess. And, and I get that from your, from your book. You're trying to recapture that that sense of uh you know these 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 are unique stories <laughs> uh in human history yeah no i i agree with that absolutely paul um uh, two two thoughts strike me about what you're saying the first is that um you're right it it, it is so unique and so i used predominantly the jerusalem bible but also the new revised standard version and they're both I think very good translations, very uh, very readable, but still still uh, still full of uh, personality. They haven't been dumbed down to to uh, to sort of mid Californian idiom or something like this. But uh, it is the case that other religious traditions have seen God or a God or some gods interact with human beings or walk on the earth or something, normally in some time before time, you know, Krishna in a mythical time or something. But no other religious sensibility, as far as I know, in human history has ever conceived of the idea of the eternal, everlasting, all-powerful, omnipotent, omniscient God becoming a human being and suffering defeat and torture and death and humiliation. That's why I started the book with a chapter on the crucifixion. I think in a way, the death of Jesus, the crucifixion, is an even more radical claim that Christianity makes than the resurrection. I mean, if you believe in God at all, you'd believe that God is immortal, God can conquer death. But the idea that God would suffer death, would suffer crucifixion, a, a humiliating death. And then the other thing, the other thought that I'd offer you, Paul, is that um, the Gospels and, and the New Testament generally are fantastic to read. They are absolutely fantastic to read. So devout Christians and even non-devout Christians like me who just go to Mass and so on, you, you, you hear a passage from the Gospel or from the Bible and uh, the priest reflects on its theological significance. And that's, that's terrific. That's extremely good. That's a good thing for Christians to do. A lot of Christians meditate on a passage and seek its theological significance. But I really urge people to read the New Testament uh, as readers, just to read it. Maybe not read all four Gospels first, maybe read Luke first and then go to the letters and then come back and do another Gospel, but to read it sort of a book at a time. The, the longest of Paul's letters is only 11 pages or something. You're not going to die of old age while you read it. But to read it as a reader, just to read it for the narrative. And I think it has a special power when you do that. And as I say, you get all, all the humanity um, you know, the, the poor old apostles always falling down and, and Jesus picking them up again. And, uh, you know, they're not they're not superheroes. Uh, they make lots and lots of mistakes. Um, 
I love the Acts of the Apostles, wonderful recount. You, you see the early church, one thing Paul is very concerned with is fundraising. And you see, you know, the, the early Christians didn't live just by diaphanous vision. You know, they, there's a real messy sort of... Uh, and then, you know, I love the agency of Mary, you know, where she accepts the Archangel Gabriel's uh, message and she she becomes the mother of Jesus and she becomes pregnant and at first Joseph doesn't understand. So, so she responds by going off by herself to her cousin Elizabeth for three months and proclaiming proclaiming Jesus and the the brilliant humanity and the dynamism and the wonder. And then the final thought, I'm rabbiting on too long, but the different styles within the New Testament. So the voice of John is completely unmistakable, I think. There's nothing like it in literature. John is just one of those Christians who is constantly struck by the magnificence of what he's, uh, what he's dealing with. And this comes through to us, I think, 2,000 years later ac across the translation. Yeah, absolutely right, uh, Greg. And, uh, and that's why, you know, that's why he's, the, he's, he's uh, traditionally symbolises the eagle. You know, his gospel really does soar. And uh, has yes. a vision of Christ from from above in a certain way, although it's, it's still very human. And uh, and John was, you know, obviously writing against that that, that first heresy, which was uh, the Gnostic anti flesh heresy. And also, you know, you're completely right about the crucifixion. I think you get a sense in Paul sometimes when you read Paul's letters that he thinks, oh, gee. Would have been great if Jesus wasn't crucified. It'd be a lot easier to sell. Because <laughs> that was such a, you know, for the Jews and the Romans, that was a massive stumbling block. Because you know, how could how could a God do that? You know, that's the yeah. the worst possible death. So I think you you're spot on. Look, Greg, I want to turn now to the sort of second second part of the the book and and look at. I, I love the chapter on on popular culture and and how Christianity sort of gets smuggled in sometimes and and even today. And I teach uh, I've taught a course on uh, on theology and film before, and uh, and I love doing that because you can, you know, basically every film you can find some sort of strand of <laughs> Christian theology and redemption in it. But there's, there's some more specific than others and. And when I was reading your 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 book, I actually watched for the first time the 1950s version of Graham Greene's um, End of the Affair, which I hadn't seen in film. And I was, yeah, I, was, I, I loved it. You know, I thought, gee, wow, how Catholic is this? <laughs> you know, this like, you know, how Christian is this book, is this film? And uh, and to see, you know, you mentioned it in your book. So I just maybe if you want to comment a little bit about, you know, how Christianity can infuse popular culture and and how Christians really should use popular culture more. Well, Paul, I tell you what, if I possibly ever can in my life, I want to come and enrol in your course on, <laughs> uh, on Christianity and film. You know, if I had three years, I would come and make your life misery by being an undergraduate <laughs> at, uh, at Campion. But I would certainly like to do the, film, the course on uh, film and theology. Uh, I think sometimes... Um, the, some of the best Christian writing that I like the most uh, deals with Christianity and popular culture. And uh, this chapter was an opportunity to do that. And of course, popular culture 60 years ago or, or 70 years ago was absolutely infused with Christianity. You look at the Academy Award uh, uh, winners, the best films were typically Christian films uh, from Going My Way, How Green Was My Valley, The Sound of Music. Um, Catholic priests were played by Spencer Tracy, Gregory Peck, Bing Crosby. Not a bad, not a bad group of people. <laughs> Angels were played by Cary Grant. I mean, this is pretty, this is as good as the human race can do in uh, in uh, paying a tribute to, to Angels in that lovely movie, uh, The Bishop's Wife. And the bestseller list of books. You know, uh, Thomas Merton's uh, The Seven-Sided Mountain or Elected Silence, as they called it uh, uh, in um, in England, I think. It came out the story of his vocation as a Cistercian Trappist monk, sold three million copies on publication. And uh, the, the great novels of the 50s and 60s, The Cardinal, Henry Merton, now that's all gone. Mm -hmm. So there was a chapter, there was a, a, a temptation to write a chapter of lament mm -hmm. for, for this lost golden period but that would have been that's wrong that I, I think christians never should write essays of cultural despair 
First of all, there's no reason to despair. And second of all, it leads nowhere. And if you tell people it's all gone, it's all finished, we're all done, well, then their normal reaction is, okay, well, then I'm going to the races. You know, just forget all about it then. I'll do something else. But uh, what you're seeing now in popular culture is that Christianity keeps coming back. You can't keep it down. And it comes back both in mainstream culture and in in things that Christians do, as it were, almost on a Samizdat basis. So a lot of mainstream culture now is overtly hostile to Christianity. And in a sense, that pays a tribute to Christianity in itself. Um, the one development that I don't like is, is where you get a sort of ersatz, empty Christianity. So I cite a few films and TV series where Christianity imposes no demands on the people at all. They can behave absolutely uh, like the secular culture around them, but they still, you know, have a friend who's a pastor or go to church on Sundays or something. That, I think, is much more dangerous than overtly anti-Christian material. But then you get this great rebirth of Christian material here and there in the culture. So you see a great Australian film like Ride Like a Girl and the uh, jockey um, uh, is is a Catholic, and they can't render her life fairly without dealing in some way with the role of faith in her family's life. Or you get a movie like um, uh, A Beautiful Day in the Neighbourhood about a Christian broadcaster, and he was so popular. Everybody loved him so much. You just couldn't, you couldn't deal with his life without uh, acknowledging the Christianity. Then much to my surprise, Paul, um, I watched a series called Jane the Virgin, and... Uh, this was because my wife and I were in London. We were sharing, obviously, a hotel room. And I was at one end writing my, you know, articles about the Chinese Communist Party. And she was at the other end watching this series on her iPad. And I couldn't help but overhear the dialogue. And, and it was kind of quite en enthralling and entri enticing. And I ended up watching it. Now, this is a series. This is a modern commercial American series about a young uh, Hispanic woman of Venezuelan origin living in Florida with her mother and grandmother, who decides to remain a virgin until marriage. And, and by the idiotic conceptions of American sitcoms, she is wrongly artificially inseminated and she becomes pregnant. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an American comedy or drama comedy, dramedy, I suppose. And in its later series, it goes off, off the rails a bit and it's probably a bit objectionable right in the last series or so. But all the way through, her Christianity and specifically her Catholicism they are a positive spiritual force. And I think what the producers were doing here was they were trying to be very friendly to Hispanic Americans. And they realized they couldn't render Hispanic Americans without rendering their Catholicism. And uh, it's actually quite lovely all the way through. And she's just a regular girl. You know, she's not a theological genius or anything. But, and this commitment to her virginity is is regarded as a positive, it's something that she, she does maintain until her marriage, and it's it's regarded as a positive force. But then, and then of course there's great literature, like, so I, I love novels of 100 years ago, but the contemporary novelist Marilyn Robinson is writing these most majestic, brilliant Christian novels, especially Gilead, which are just irresistible. Gilead won the Pulitzer Prize in 2005 or whenever it was published. And you couldn't imagine anything less likely uh, to, to be um, fashionable. It's the reminiscences of a 77-year-old congregationalist minister in the Midwest just before he's going to die. And yet it's a, it's a wonderful novel. But the final point I'd leave you with, Paul, there is as well as complaining about culture, we Christians need to create culture. So Campion College has done this magnificently. It's created this whole institution in the Catholic liberal arts tradition. It's absolutely magnificent. But a lot of Christians are doing this in popular entertainment too. So I interview an American uh, Pentecostal leader, Pastor Sammy Rodriguez. One of the things he does is he makes um, Hollywood films. So the Pentecostals, very contemporary movement, Unlike Catholics and Anglicans, they don't have the great institutions, universities and hospitals, but they're very comfortable with contemporary culture. So he raises finance. His movies typically cost 10 or $15 million to make. They have terrific um, Christian themes in them, and they are commercially successful. One was nominated for an Academy Award in one category, and it, it made $50 million. And it's a completely pro-Christian uh, 
uh, rendering. And then the a series I'm sure you're familiar with, I don't deal with in the book, but I should have, The Chosen, this um, TV series, they couldn't, get, it's, it's about Jesus and the first apostles. It's orthodox, but it, it goes beyond the gospels in creating backstory, but it does so entirely sympathetically to the, to the um, meaning and tradition of the gospels. And um, they couldn't get major Hollywood funding. So they crowdsourced $10 million for the first series, $10 million for the second series. I've only watched a couple of episodes, but it's terrific. And it's been watched by tens or hundreds of millions of people around the world. So Christians can do this. We've just got to be kind of self-confident. We've got to jump in. You know, you don't win the lottery if you don't buy a ticket. Yeah, absolutely. And I think The Chosen is a really good example. It's, um, yeah, as you say, it's completely uh, crowdsourced and, uh, yeah. and, fr and free to watch, but they just encourage people to pay for the next person to watch it. And it's uh, incredible, uh, incredibly well done. Um, now, lastly, Greg, I want to speak to you about, I guess, the um, the penultimate, the, the final chapters, which you, you know, you, where you're interviewing various, you know, Christians today, is it, you know, some famous, some not so famous, even a Campion graduate, uh, you know, Frances Cantrell and her work with the Culture Project. And, um, you know, I'm very touched, you know, reading these various um, accounts of, uh, of people and their faith and how their faith is put into action, you know, from a, from a current Prime Minister of Australia uh, through to, you know, someone, I think it's Gemma, is it, who's founded these schools in Tanzania, an Australian, Australian girl. You know, wonderful stories of, of faith and, and faith in action. And so just a couple of points on that. One is the, um, yeah, these, these are very inspiring and, um, and, um, and show how Christianity is lived today in a very real way. But also, this is a, another really good thing about your books, Greg, they're very ecumenical and... Um, in the, in, the, in the good sense of that word. I, sometimes when I hear ecumenical, I have a, a natural sort of phobia, I guess, of, you know, let's sit down and all agree with each other um, when, when, in fact, we, we, we don't. But there's a lot of common ground um, amongst uh, the various Christian denominations, and we need to foster that. And, and I think you really do that well in, in your books. But just if you, if you wouldn't mind commenting on, on your experiencing, experience of these various interviews and, and experience of... You know, finding out about you know how Christians live today. Well, Paul, uh, uh, I appreciate your comments about the ecumenical uh, element. Uh, so I do try to write these books. So uh, no doubt, I'm a Catholic and I'm proud of my tradition and and everything like that. But but uh, th I've tried to write these books very consciously from you know what C.S. Lewis called the mere Christianity uh, viewpoint. So. Really, any Christian who can assert the Apostles' Creed. Um, and I've had wonderful hospitality and friendship with uh, Pentecostals and Evangelicals and people from Eastern Orthodox traditions and in the previous book, the Coptic uh, Christians and so on. And, of course, we do agree on 99% of things. I, I'm not suggesting denominational differences aren't important, but, you know, the, the whole culture has now completely forgotten what Christianity is all about. So... It's great now that all the denominations can join in friendship and broadcast the message about the 99% that they dis that they agree on instead of the Irish disease of fighting to the death over the 1% that you, that you disagree on. So the people in the second half of the book, some of them I knew very well in advance, like Scott Morrison, and I think he, you know, this is not a left versus right book. This is not an endorsement of him nor a criticism of him, but just I think he handles the public dimension of his faith very well. There's no doubt at all that his Christian faith is the centre of his life, and that doesn't make his policies right or wrong. He's very clear that, you know, God doesn't tell him what fiscal policy he should adopt or whether he should deregulate the industrial relations system. And I'm not interested in that question. I'm only interested in what he believes and how faith influences his life. I was very thrilled to meet Francis Cantrell, a graduate of Campion, who's running the Culture Project, which is for young people. So she's in her 20s and, and she's ministering to people that's in their teens, the school age and in their 20s to try to tell them that they're worth much more than what contemporary culture is offering them. I mean, contemporary culture, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, the late Rabbi Jonathan Sachs argued this, is kind of replicating a version of ancient pagan culture, which was very destructive, a terrible, terrible culture for women and girls and very destructive generally. And Francis Cantrell is, is, has a positive message to young people that they are 
they are much better than this. They deserve much better. The, they, they're called to be much better. Gemma Cecilia, the, um, the woman from northern New South Wales, thought she might be a nun, went off to help in Africa, has just had a lifelong desire to help people. And she has founded now these three most brilliant schools, the schools of St. Jude. She's a very uh, uh, winning person, terrific uh, Catholic, very practical. Her schools are non-denominational. They're not even Christian. I mean, people of every religion and no religion. Uh, but they often say the prayer of St. Jude, you know. So she, she feels that St. Jude is her best friend. She's got a statue of St. Jude on her desk. She's got an agreement with St. Jude. If she ever can't raise the annual budget for the school, she's going to change its name. He's never let her down. Her, her enterprise is just unbelievable. She's founded these three huge, magnificent schools, which educate thousands and thousands of really poor um, uh, Africans who have some academic ability but are very poor and would never... Um, receive an education without what she'd done. And I found, I only interviewed her over Zoom and so on. I read a little memoir she wrote. I found that uh, at the end of talking to her, I felt happier about being a human being. I, I really felt that human beings were not so bad after all. The final case, there, there are quite a few others, uh, you know, religious leaders and so on. But one interview I did find quite moving myself was um, with Bill Hayden. So, Bill, knowing Bill reflects, I guess, my age, Bill was uh, uh, a minister in the Whitlam government, then he was leader of the Labor Party for a number of years, then he was foreign minister in the Hawke government, and then he was governor general. And he had been a conscientious atheist all his life. Uh, he'd won the Humanist of the Year Award and so on. And when I knew him in politics, occasionally we would discuss religion because I would write the odd column about religion. And uh, looking back, I think he was a really good man who was always suffering a crisis of unbelief. And um, he's very unwell these days and he's very frail. It was a tremendous effort for him to talk to me. But he told me of his conversion back to the Catholicism of his childhood. He told me a terrible story about uh, his five-year-old daughter being run down when he was a young, a young man and, and killed and how he never got over that. This, he was deranged with grief, he says. He went to see a Catholic priest and he, he appreciated everything the priest did for him and said for him, but, but he just couldn't, couldn't believe. And he'd have these terrible dreams where uh, he'd meet her later in life and she'd grown up and had a good life <clears throat> and he'd meet her at a shopping centre and she had kids and it had all been some terrible misunderstanding and then he'd wake up and find that that was not true. He told me about um, the brutality of his father towards his mother and... Uh, how as a kid, this is what decided him that he was going to be a policeman because he was going to grow up and stop men like that from treating women like his mother in the way that they did. But then he had this lifelong, in my view, kind of search for decency, very decent man, Bill, altogether. He was tremendously influenced by his own wife, who is a Christian believer, and by one nun in Brisbane who helped him bring Medicare into existence. He went to see a few years ago after she'd had a heart attack. She's in her 90s now. And he just felt an overwhelming sense of holiness in her presence. And he'd wrestled with these issues, these ideas of belief for a long, long time. And finally, he said to me, he just could not bear the emptiness of atheism. And he became convinced that the holiness which, um, which motivated and propelled this nun was real, that God was real, that the call to holiness was real. And he came back to the church and now he, he wants to, uh, he's as active as he can be within the church and, um, and he leads a life of prayer. And, uh, you know, he's had a tough, interesting life, Bill Hayden. And uh, the, he's, he has the hardest of hard minds and there's nothing sort of um, soppy or sentimental about him. But I just found this journey back to faith tremendously, uh, tremendously affecting. And I found that I was full of admiration for Bill Hayden and uh, and the journey his life has taken. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful read too, and you tell it so well, Greg. Now, we, we could speak all day, Greg, 
I'm sure, <laughs> on many things, and, but particularly what, what comes out in this book. We also want people to read the book, so we don't want to say everything about it. And um, and so we'll, we'll wind it up now. But I just want to thank you again, Greg, and and, um, and really recommend this uh this book it is, it is a terrific read but it's a it's a book that you know i your first book I, I certainly gave to 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 friends and family who are perhaps struggling a bit with their belief and and likewise with this book because it is very winsome um it's uh, it's very you know non-threatening but but uh, but also has great substance in it and um so highly recommend it and congratulate you very much greg it will um as you as you know greg we uh we are embarking on a on a fairly major building project here at the college. We may have even heard some trucks going on in the background here. Uh, building a new library, and um, and this will certainly be placed in the library, <laughs> the present one and the new one. Um, and we are very uh, very happy that you're an honorary fellow here, and um, and it's been great to chat to you again, Greg. Well, Paul, thank you so much. I wish every success to Campion College. Uh, the, my only criticism of it, it came about 45 years too late uh, for me, but uh, it's fantastic work that you're doing. I, I love everything about Campion College. I'm very grateful that you do this, uh, that you do this podcast. I wish all power to your elbow and, um, you know, Campion will grow and flourish. And, uh, you know, um, I just think it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic enterprise and it's a thrill to me to be associated with it. And if I do make it to the pearly gates, you know, after several million years in purgatory, being associated with Campion might just be the last thing that just finally gets me across the line. Here, oh. I, I can live in hope anyway. Please, God. Please, God. Well, thanks so much, uh, Greg. And thanks, everyone, for uh, for tuning in, joining in. Please share it. We've recorded this interview for you to, for you to share it, share it wide, and obviously uh, share the news about this book. And also share the news about this new project here at Campion College of uh, our new building project. Visit our website and encourage the young people in your life to think about a liberal arts degree here at Campion. We've got summer programs coming up in January, which are a wonderful opportunity for young people to experience a few days of what it be, means to be a Campion student. So thanks again. Thanks again, Greg. And, um, Thank you, Paul. And God bless everyone. Thank you, Paul.